138 MMA here, back finally to break down UFC Fight Night, Grasau versus Arujao. It feels like an eternity since we got to do one of these full card preview and predictions videos, but I tell you what, I am super excited to get into this one. We've had a few fights fall out. Uh, the Daniel Rodriguez, Neil Magnify has been rebooked. Melsic Bogdazarian versus Joe Anderson Brito is canceled. No word on a replacement yet, or if there will be. So, a couple of fights gone. Still a fun card. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself next week, as I struggled so much this past week, or this weekend, I guess, while I'm recording this, to uh, put out some videos. I'll put something out. I'm not sure what, but I'll put something out. But gosh, am I excited for this fight card, just because I've been chomping at the bit to watch some, some live fights. So, here we go. Without any further ado, we're going to break down the whole card, starting with the first fight of the night as it's listed on Tapology, all the way up to the main event as it is listed on Tapology, which I assume is Crossover Zerusha because that's the name of the card. So, without any further ado, as I've already said, let's get to the first fight of the night, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138 MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world! This is the matchup you've all been waiting to hear about. Mike Jackson taking on Pete Rodriguez. In this one, we've got two guys showing their full record here in their last five fights. Rodriguez 4-1, whereas Jackson is 1-1 one, one, and 1 no contest. That no contest, I believe, was the CM Punk fight, so, you know, take that for what you will. Um, his one win being by disqualification. Also, take that for what you will. Uh, but here we go. So we're going to break these guys down. For Mike Jackson, he is six foot two, which is a pretty good size advantage over a 5'9 Rodriguez that could play a role here. Um, he does have decent striking, Muay Thai boxing style. Um, it looks good on a bag, looks good hitting the pads. I haven't really seen it too much in the cage because, like I said, he's had three fights. All of them, all of them in the UFC-ish. This loss is against Mickey Gall, which I don't think technically took place in the UFC. But either way, I don't know. It, very inexperienced. We haven't really seen a whole lot from him uh, as far as in the cage, what he can do. But he does seem to have okay striking outside of that, which usually isn't comparable. But I'm, I'm kind of grasping at straws here. This fight's kind of a weird one. Um, but he's nowhere near UFC level. And I think that's pretty obvious by his last fight. Even though he won by disqualification, that's because, what was that, Dean Barry is, was just fighting as dirty as you could possibly fight. So there's that. Uh, for Rodriguez, on the other hand, uh, he has wins that aren't by DQ. So that's good. Uh, that's a good plus there. Um, he is aggressive. I can see him using that to close this, this big height gap here, um, get it up to the cage and work his, his punches from there. He's also not likely UFC level either, though. And at the odds, I think that's insane because he's a huge, huge favorite. Um, I believe you can get plus 500 on Jackson. And I don't know that that's... I wouldn't play that, personally. I would just leave this fight off entirely. This is a terrible fight. Um, I just... I don't I don't see how this fight goes well for either guy, really. Nobody's stock really rises. For Rodriguez, if you beat Jackson, you just... I mean, you beat a guy that you everybody was supposed to beat. Um, and if Jackson, if you beat Rodriguez, well, Rodriguez gets dropped from the UFC. You're still not UFC level. And the UFC struggles because they have to find you another opponent, probably, unless they can still cut you off a win, which I don't know that they can. I'm not sure how that works. But either way, I guess the pick will be Rodriguez, just for the sake of making a pick. But I picked Barry last time uh, Jackson had a fight, and that obviously turned out to be a DQ win for Jackson. So I looked like a dummy there, thinking that, oh, this is a lock. He should crush him, which he was until he decided to stick his finger so far in Mike Jackson's eye socket that he could have pulled out some brain tissue. But anyway, the pick for me is Rodriguez. I don't trust this fight at all. Watch this one with your, uh, with your, uh, with your entertainment glasses on only. We're going to start the card by cracking open a couple of root beers with our feet up on the coffee table and calling this one a day. This, this fight is just leave it off. It's, it's too weird. So like I said, for me, it's Rodriguez. If you feel strongly about one of these guys, Put it in the comments below, and we'll go to the next fight. We've got a really interesting matchup here. Tatsuro Teara taking on CJ Vergara. 4-1 for Vergara in his last five fights. 5-0 uh, over on the other side for Teara. Uh, he's also undefeated, so 11-0. I did forget to close that, so bear with me on that one. Um, we're going to start with the Teara side. In his last matchup against uh, Candelario, I was kind of leaning Candelario just the slightest bit because of the low level of competition or the so-so competition, as I put it there, that Tiara has fought. 
But that last fight, he really impressed me. He showed that his grappling skills work at the UFC level. Because Candelario, although he's not a top-level UFC fighter, he's pretty good and he's an entertaining fighter. He will make you work. And Tayara was able to control him on the ground pretty well, use his, um, use his grappling to really kind of make it a very one-sided fight for a lot of the fight. There were moments, but it was pretty much one-sided in my opinion. Um, he does have some really slick submission wins uh, outside of the UFC, of course. He's only had one UFC fight. And that was a decision, but he does have some really slick submission wins outside of the UFC. So for, for Tayara, the grappling is the strongest upside for him. He does have okay striking, or at least from what we could see um, against the competition that he's fought, it was pretty good. But the grappling is where his bread gets buttered, if you will. For Vergara, on the other hand, he's more of the striker with the really, really awkward kind of striking, but it seems to work for him. Obviously, he's 4-1 in his last five, so it's not like he's out there just losing fights, striking with some weird style. He's getting it done. Um, and he does work those knees in really well. I believe on the contender series, that's how he won the fight. Hit the guy with a knee right up the middle, dropped him. It was a beautiful knee. Vergara proved me wrong in his last fight as well. So both these guys kind of proved me wrong in their last fights. Um, Rodriguez was my pick over Vergara in the last fight, and it was close. It was really close. Some people have argued that Vergara did not win that fight. Either way, the judges gave it to him. He did show durability. He showed that he can press on when, when the fight is in question. And even if you don't think he won, he did show some upside in that fight. So for me, that, that, was, that was kind of a good step for Vergara. I don't really like the way he strikes, but it seems to be working for him. So I can't complain. His grappling seems not too bad either. He's, I just, I don't know. There's something about him that just, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't look like he's going to go too far in the UFC. But he, I mean, he keeps winning. He keeps getting it done. He's only lost one in his last five fights, as you see there. So uh, I do take Tayar in this fight. I don't like the odds. I think he should get the win. But Vergara, Vergara proved me wrong last time in the in the uh, Clayton Rodriguez fight. So for me, I lean Tayara. If you think if if you think there's like a clear cut winner here, let me know. I believe Tayara is close to I think what minus two sixty, minus two seventy, something like that. Uh, so if you if you've got a strong opinion one way or the other, let me know in the comments. But for me, Desirto should get the win. Vergara could surprise us all. I'm leaving this one off. Definitely, it scares me after Vergara's last fight with that close win. So, like I said, let me know and toss this video a like. I'll see you on the next fight. Have I mentioned yet that there's a lot of fights on this card where I'm not super confident in them? Here we go into another one. We have Piero Rodriguez taking on Sam Sam Page Hughes. Now. For Rodriguez, she's 5-0 in her last five because she is 8-0 overall. She is an undefeated prospect. 2-3 for Hughes, which is, a, which is a bad record in your last five fights. Uh, but she has fought better level competition, I would say. Um, the only UFC fight for Rodriguez was against Kay Hansen, who is no longer in the UFC. Also known for being undersized for the division. So we do have that. So uh, for this fight here, <clears throat> I like a lot of things on both sides. For Rodriguez, she should have the better striking, but her striking is all right, but it's it's not because she's like awesome at striking. Sam Hughes is terrible at striking. It's bad. It's really bad. She shouldn't strike at all. Her best path to victory is just avoiding that entirely. I know it's predictable, but just go for the takedowns because it's all you're good at. Uh, ah, that's not all she's good at. She's good at top pressure, things like that, but she's not good at striking. She should not try to strike at all. So for Sam Hughes, if she tries to strike, she's going to get hit a lot because she's not good at it. For Rodriguez, it's a clear advantage for her. So if she can keep the fight in striking range, she should be able to win whether she's a good striker or not. She seems okay. She doesn't seem too bad at it. But Sam Hughes is terrible at it. For the grappling, both both ladies do have some strong grappling skills. I give Hughes the edge in that department, though, and let me tell you why. So Hughes has amazing cardio, and we've seen that in her fight so far. She can turn on a pace in the third round after the other ladies have maybe won the first round or so. Uh, and Hughes can turn it on and just go and go and go. So she's a, she has great cardio. She did switch up the camp a few fights ago, and since then she's won two fights. So good on her. She's at, what, 4-7 to May now, I believe. Um, she's also be the bigger fighter here, so she should be able to get that weight across Rodriguez and be able to hold her down. And we've noticed this, and I hate to say just in women's MMA, but it is more prevalent in women's MMA. That, some, that the bigger fighter can often bully the other fighter with their size, even if it's just a little bigger. And Hughes, I believe she's like, what, two inches taller or something? Not not a lot. Not enough to even make it a note on the board, on the on the trusty marker board here. Not even enough for that. 
But she is the bigger fighter, and if she can get her weight across Rodriguez, I think she can bank rounds there. We've seen her use her ground and pound to win fights. She did that against Elise Reed, pounded her out pretty well. Uh, so for me, I as as much as I don't want to say it, I don't mind a shot on the underdog here in Sam Hughes. I'm not confident in this fight whatsoever. This is also the third fight of the night, and I've mentioned the name Rodriguez in all three fights. That's kind of interesting. Uh, but I do think Sam Hughes gets the win here probably six out of ten times. I don't know if I don't know I don't know if I'm it, that might not be accurate. But I, I even if you play your five say five out of ten times. We'll say five out of ten times. I think this is 50-50. I think Hughes gets the win five out of ten times. And with that being the case, if she is the underdog, which she is, I don't mind a shot there. But for me, I'm not confident enough in this one to say it's worth a pick. Uh, but I will pick Sam Hughes because that's what I do in these videos. I do have to make a pick. So Sam Hughes for me, if you think Rodriguez has shown some serious upside that I'm missing, yes, she's undefeated. I haven't really seen a ton out of her. She beat Kay Hansen, but Kay Hansen obviously not in the UFC anymore. Way undersized. I don't know how she does against a bigger fighter in Sam Hughes at the UFC level. So let me know what you think. Let's just move right along, though. We've got some more exciting fights on the card coming up soon. Finally, a fight I can feel pretty confident in my pick. So for this one here, we have Rafael Sunsal taking on Victor Henry. For Sunsal, he's 1-4 and four in his last five fights. Henry 4-1, and one, as you see on the board here. Both guys kind of in the later years of their career. I know that Victor Henry is fairly new to the UFC, but he is 35 years of age. Over on the other side for Sunsal, he is 40. I'm going to start with a Sun Tzu here a little bit more. Um, he is on a four-fight losing streak, and that's not what you like to see out of a out of out of a guy that's coming in here fighting a guy coming off a big win over Barcelos. Um, I guess I'm going to bounce back and forth. So that's what we get. So Victor Henry coming off a big win over uh, Hione Barcelos, who that win has aged pretty well because Barcelos bounced back pretty dang good in his in his fight. I guess not last week, two weeks ago, because that was the last fight card. Um, that four-fight skid, on the other hand, for a Sun Tzu doesn't look great. So his last win, 2018, his chin has been checked a couple of times in that those last four fights, or his last four losses, which are his last four fights, uh, that everybody knows about that viral knockout that Cody Garbrandt had over him, put him to sleep. He also has another, another KO loss in there. The chin's just fading, okay? And that happens when you're 40 years old. It's just the way it works. It's unfortunate, but it is true, especially at the lower weight classes. One thing I want to point out, though, for a Sun Sal, he has an incredible resume. He has wins over both guys fighting for the title at UFC 280. He has a win over Aljamain Sterling and TJ Dillashaw, as well as, is I think his most recent win, the one right here, was actually over Rob Font. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that last win was over Rob Font, which is a pretty big deal. He's beaten some top guys, but those years are behind him. Like I said, his last win was 2018, and that does not look good. Over on the Henry side, really good pace, really good wrestling, with the with the striking, it's more of just the pace that gets you. His striking isn't super technical or super high level, but the pace he puts on is, is rough. That wrestling, he mixes that in. Um, for me, this is a clear-cut pick, not because a Sun Tzu doesn't have the skills, but the, that father time has caught up with a Sun Tzu. The age is coming in. The chin is falling apart. He just, I hate to say he doesn't have any more, but I don't think he has any more, at least not at the UFC level. Put this guy against somebody that's not UFC level. Yeah, he probably gets it done. A Sun Tzu's still got those skills. It's just, can he implement them into the level he used to used to be able to? And I do not think so. So for me, Victor Henry is a pretty good pick here. I do think that the, him being the five-year younger fighter, um, still being able to put on a high pace, like I said, is able to get that win over Helen and Barcelos in his last fight. And Barcelos looks great right now. So for me, it should be pretty clear cut. If you think I'm overlooking something, let me know. But a Sun Tzu, unfortunately, this is probably his last time out. I hope, actually. If he, if he loses this fight, I really hope he retires. You don't like to see guys in their 40s just going in there and getting beat up and knocked out. It's happened to too many of them lately. But the UFC is getting pretty good about letting people get out of there pretty quick when they start to go on these slumps. Some of them just hang around too long. But we've seen a lot of them retire lately. So hopefully that's what we see from a Sun Tzu after the Henry loss. Unless, of course, he pulls it out. And has a career resurgence. And if so, well then, great. More power to him. Let him stick around for a while. But for me, Victor Henry's the winner here. Let me know what you think. And we'll move right along. Another strangely close matchup between Nick Maximov and Jacob Malkoon. Malkoon, Malkoon coming in 3-2 and two in his last five. 4-1 and one on the Maximov side. This is a fight between two guys that both want the same thing. As you see here, I've highlighted their strong grappling control. That's what both of them like to do. They want to get, your, get you to the ground and control you. And both of them do pretty well at that. 
Uh, something else I like to highlight is their amount of takedowns per 15 minutes. We've got 5.51 average for the maximum side, 6.95 over here from Alcoon. That shows right there that both guys want to get the takedown. The thing that's different here, we're going to see a couple of things. The takedown defense. Uh, Maximov has a really good takedown defense. There's no stat for Malkoon in the UFC because nobody has tried. So I don't know. I assume it's good because nobody's tried or they just realize they don't want to go to the ground with the guy because he's pretty dang good there. So there is that. The takedown defense stat is kind of up in the air. The submission loss to Petrowski for Maximov is the thing that kind of makes me lean one way and I'm going to kind of give it away now. I am picking Malkoon in this fight as the underdog. Not mega confident in it. This is a very close fight. But that submission loss to Andre Petrovsky in the first round scares me away from picking Maximov against another high-level grappler. I don't know how good Petrovsky is. He's beaten a lot of lower-level guys in the UFC. Maximov being the first guy that was decently highly touted, uh, kind of as a, as a good prospect. So for me, I'm going to take the Malkoon side because of how he went in a, a pretty decent fight against Brendan Allen, was able to work back and forth in that fight and not just get wrecked whereas Maximov on the other hand when they put him up against someone who's working their way up the ladder being Petrowski Petrowski got him out in the first round and I really did not see that being the case especially with Maximov being such a strong grappler like he is so when you put a grappler versus a grappler and he's coming out on the losing end pretty quickly might have just been a slip up it does happen people get caught anybody it can happen to anyone but I have to go off of what I've seen, and the best thing I can do is pick Malkoon in this one. But like I said, I'm not super confident in this. If you are really confident one way or the other, let me know. I don't see a big discrepancy in their striking. Neither of them really want to do that typically. This may end up being a striking battle, and if so, it could go either way. I still lean Malkoon. The values on him as the underdog as opposed to a, a favorite. So, yeah, not confident in it. Another fight that I would leave off the card unless you're a total degenerate. And if so, there you go. You have my pick. But let me know what you think. If you feel strongly one way or another, I would love to hear it. I would love to hear what you've found in your research. Maybe maybe you'll get me to sway my decision one way or the other a little bit more strongly. But like I said, another one that I'm not super confident in. Let's move on to one that I am. So let's get going. On to the next fight. Here we go. We got Brandon Davis, 4-1 and one in his last five fights, taking on Mana Martinez, who is 3-2 in his last five fights. This fight here is an interesting one to me because Brandon Davis is a guy that's known to be able to kind of take a shot, keep coming forward, get into a brawl. But Mana Martinez is known to be a very accurate striker that can drop you with one shot. So this should be an interesting fight. I do think Brandon Davis is going to have a pretty strong grappling advantage. The thing is, he doesn't really go for that a lot. He tends to... He, he he has some wins in the regional scene with, with submissions, but he also tends to like to get into a war. And I don't think that's his best back to victory here against Mano Martinez. I do think Mano Martinez is a much better striker. And I do think he has the power to put out a guy like Brandon Davis, who in his last fight was finished uh, by Dana Bakari, I believe is how you pronounce that. But he was finished in his last fight. Mano Martinez has some darn good striking. It does look good. He does lack takedown defense, though. So, path to victory for Davis is the takedown. If he gets it, I do think he can beat Martinez. However, I do think we're going to see another striking battle. Martinez is going to be able to put a pace on him, put some punches down, down range, hit him with some volume. Because as we've seen, Brandon Davis does get hit. That's how we know he has a good chin, or at least has had a good chin until that last fight. I've got a question mark there, because is it fading? It might be. Something else I wanted to point out that was very interesting... Casey Jones, the guy from Ninja Turtles. Juan Martinez has three wins over that guy. That's pretty crazy. Wonder if that's the same guy. But anyway, I'm going to take Mana Martinez in this fight. That was a horrible joke. Please bear with me. If you are a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan, don't forget to like this video because I've decided that that's a big, big mark in this fight that we've got to point out is that Mana Martinez has wins, three of them over Casey Jones of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame. Moving right along. My pick here, Mono Martinez. I think the striking's better. I don't think Brandon Davis is going to take it to the ground. And if he does, I if he does, I think it might be too little too late at that point. Might be towards the end of a round. Run out of time before he can get the submission. Already eating a bunch of damage from Martinez. I think Martinez could even get the knockout here. We saw it in the last fight. Davis's chin might be fading. Or it might not. Maybe it was a fluke. But either way, I'm still taking Martinez. Let me know what you guys think. I think this will be a fun fight for as long as it lasts. I don't expect it to go the distance. 
So maybe the under is a good play. But anyway, let me know. On to the next one. Next up, Misha Sirkinov taking on Alonzo Menafield. Now for these two here, we got one and four in the last five for Sirkinov, three and two on the Menafield side. This is an interesting matchup because I have a negative here by 35 for Sirkinov. I know Alonzo Menafield is actually 34, which is really close in age. But Sirkinov is showing his age, whereas Menafield really isn't. Um, how do I put this? So Sirkinov, obviously one and four in his last five fights. His last three fights are all losses. He's been finished in uh, nearly every, I think every one of his UFC fights that he's lost, he has been finished except for his uh, Christoph Jotko fight. And that's because Jotko doesn't finish anybody. He wants to go to decision every single time. I don't know what's up with that, but that's what he does. So the only fight he lost by decision was against Jotko. Everybody else has finished him. Uh, with that said, he does get finishes, so he has five submission wins and one ground and pound finish in the UFC, so basically kill or be killed, uh, not really wanting to go to the scorecards, unless it's against Christoph Jotko, and that's usually what happens. So for me, it's kind of a kill or be killed mentality, but he does get a lot of wins via submission. Even outside of the UFC, his submissions are pretty solid. That age, like I said, is just catching up to him just a little bit faster than you would like to see, because over on the Menafield side... We're not seeing that, and he's only a year younger. Minifield still has that KO power, still looks bodied up, ripped, jacked, throwing bombs. Um, and he showed his, his uh, wrestling in that last fight against uh, that one fraud guy that came in with a different record than he said on the uh, Mor Morozov or something like that. I don't remember. But the guy that was terrible uh, came in with a crazy, weird record that changed the night of the fight. But that guy... So he showed his wrestling in that fight. So maybe that's a new wrinkle to his game. I don't know that that's a good path to victory here. As Sirkinov does have some crazy submissions. He's got some wins with some, some very interesting ones. Peruvian neckties, things like that. Like, you don't you don't expect that. That's a, He has a win over Jimmy Crute with a Peruvian necktie. In fact, that's his one win right here in his last five fights. So with that said, I do think Alonzo Menafield is going to have the better shot on the feet with that power. He does lack volume at times, though. So Sirkinov can use that to his advantage. For me, I don't like the odds. They're a little bit wide. Menafield should get the win. The age is really showing on the Sirkinov side. He hasn't looked good lately. Uh, his last fight was that submission of the year loss to Wellington Termon. I don't think Wellington Termon's all that great. I know people keep touting him as this next big thing, or at least Glover Teixeira does, and uh, I just don't see it. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. Um, he's been knocked out by... Um, uh what's that guy's name johnny walker that's the name i was thinking of he's been knocked out by johnny walker which if you're gonna lose to johnny walker that's usually how it is except for the last one i guess it was a submission but typically if you're gonna lose to johnny walker that's how it happens but you don't want to get knocked out that many times and he's been knocked out quite a few times it starts to catch up with you so for me metafield's the pick another one where i don't quite think the odds are worth playing it here but something that could be a good play would be the uh fight does not go the distance and the reason i say that is because Sirkinov has only gone the distance once in the UFC, and that's against Jotko. And Menafield does have that KO power. So unless, of course, Menafield just stands there with no volume and maybe one or two shots, nothing to put him out, and Sirkinov's content to just not get finished. Otherwise, I don't see this going to decision. I, I like the play of the inside the distance better. I don't know what the odds are on that. They're probably not good because I don't see... I just don't see it going the distance. So for me... I'll take Metafield. I like the inside the distance, but I wouldn't take Metafield inside the distance. Maybe? Uh, I don't know. I don't like the odds. I don't like the odds at all. But let me know what you guys think. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe I'm giving too much credit to Sirkinov, who is aging and going out. One and four in his last five. For a Sun Sal, when I broke down that fight earlier in the card, I said I would pretty much wrote him off at that. So maybe, uh, maybe I'm giving too much credit to Sirkinov here. I think it's the level of competition on the Menafield side because I do know that he will stand there and look at you and let you do stuff and not do anything for minutes at a time sometimes. So that's where I'm at. Let me know if you think I'm correct on that. Menafield did look good in his last fight, showed a little bit of a different skill set, but it's probably not a good one he would use here. So that's where we go. Let's go to the next fight. I've wasted too much time on this one. On to the next. Should be an exciting fight for as long as it lasts. We have Jordan Wright coming in two and three in his last five fights. Dusko Todorovic or Todorovic, I'm not sure which it is, coming in two and three also in his last five fights. This fight, because of Jordan Wright, I will say probably won't go outside of the first round. If it does, it won't go very far out of the first round. 
Jordan Wright has actually only made it 48 seconds into the second round in his entire career. So Wright's going to either finish the fight or get finished. We can probably say that's going to happen. It's a pretty safe bet. I know that the under one and a half on this is actually at, um, gosh, minus 150 or 160 or something silly. So and nobody sees this going past one and a half rounds because um, that's usually pretty rare that the under one and a half is is not a plus money play. So for me, I like Jordan Wright's upside at the early part of the fight. He does have good finishing upside early. His striking, he hits really hard. He has awful defense though. So he either finishes or gets finished. Good offensive, poor defensive. It does kind of lack grappling. I believe his last fight, he tried to get the takedown and then it ended up costing him. I would not count on Jordan Wright's grappling. Todorovic or Todorovic, whatever, however you say that, he does have the better grappling skills. He is a very well-rounded fighter. However, he has not lived up to the hype whatsoever. Came into the UFC undefeated, and he's now two and three in his last five fights. All of those in the UFC. His two wins over pretty low-level UFC competition. He just has not lived up to that whatsoever. And he also doesn't have very good striking uh, defense. So for me, I'm actually going to take Jordan Wright here. And the reason I, I'm picking Jordan Wright is because of the early finish upside. I think he can get uh, Dusko out of there early in the first round. And with him being a pretty big underdog, plus 170 or something like that, you're almost worth taking him by like knockout or taking him inside the first round if you can. Because I really do think Jordan Wright probably gets this done in the first round if he does get it done. If he does not, he's losing this fight for sure. He'll be toast after that first round is over. He's going to come out like a, like a freight train in that first five minutes. It should not go the whole five minutes. But if it does, Todorovic or Todorovic, however you want to say it, he's going to be the one that pulls away as the fight drags on. So at the end of the first round, if Jordan Wright does have a pretty promising round and it does get to the end of the first round, he should be a big favorite live bet. Take Todorovic. But I do think Wright's going to get it done in the first round by knockout, maybe TKO, but probably knockout. Um, yeah, haven't Todorovic has just not shown anything coming in undefeated into the UFC and then just getting beat by most decent level competition. Jordan Wright, on the other hand, he hasn't shown anything other than a brief moment of excitement early in a fight. Neither guy is going to be moving on to like title contention at any point in their career, by my understanding. But I do, like I said, just a little bit more like the offense only of the glass cannon we have over in Jordan Wright. So let me know what you think. If you think I'm crazy, that's cool. But I'm taking a shot on the dog here, um, especially with plus money. And I might even say first round finish. So that's my pick. Let me hear what you've got. Let's get going. We're almost done with this card. And we've got some sick, sick fights coming up. There's the, in the what's labeled currently as the co-main event. I am super excited about it. So let's get right along to that. This fight here has me hyped up. Brandon Roy Vial coming in three and two in his last five fights, taking on Askar Askarov, three, one, and one, that extra one there being a draw. This fight is super exciting to me with some decent title implications on the line, I would say. That flyweight division is kind of up in the air. I know we've got the, the quadrilogy coming up with uh, Figueredo taking on Moreno, but with that said, there needs to be some contenders coming up, and I think this is a fight that can do that, that can really send somebody up into the number one contender spot. So, for Raw Dog, Brandon Royval, he is 5'9 with a 70 and a half inch reach over the 5'6, 6'7, 67 inch reach for Askar Askarov. So, that height and reach advantage is pretty prevalent in this matchup. And I do think that is going to play a pretty big role as to whether or not Askarov can, can close the distance on the feet. I know Askarov does have some pretty decent boxing, but Royval also has some pretty good, darn good striking and can finish a fight on the feet or on the ground. So that's an interesting one for me. The minute winning abilities for Askarov are top tier. The guy can win minutes on the ground with his boxing, pushing up against the cage, things like that. Uh, whereas Royval has all the finishing upside. So for Royval, if he's going to win, I think it is going to be by finish. Awesome slick submissions, super wild striking, can, but can put your lights out with it. Spinning elbows, things like that, you know, coming at, coming at you from all different angles. And he's really good at capitalizing on his opponent's mistakes. Now, Askarov does not make a lot of mistakes, but if he does, you can bet that Brandon Royval is going to take every opportunity to capitalize on those mistakes in this fight. For me, though, Askarov with that really high-level grappling and pressure, um, usually able to get a lot of takedowns. Now, guys can get up against him. He's not... Uh, 
He doesn't have like a, he's not a smothering like wet blanket type of grappler, but he will take you down repeatedly. Uh, Roy Vall works relentlessly off his back. He's not one of those guys to lay there and just let you get the time on top of him. For me, this fight comes down to if it goes to decision, it's probably Askarov. If it gets if we get a finish, I'm leaning Roy Vall there. If your sports book allows you to play a bet where only if the fight goes to decision, you can play Askarov. If it allows you to say only if the fight does not go to decision, you can play Roy Vile. That should be a pretty straightaway pick for me. But if we're just talking straight up, I've got to pick somebody. Gosh, this is close. If this was a five-round fight, I would feel more confident in it. Because over the course of a five-round fight, I think there are more opportunities for Roy Vile to get the finish. This is a three-round fight. I think Askarov can can probably edge out a victory. Maybe five out of ten times. I think this is a 50-50 fight. I'm going to pick Roy Vall because I can't justifiably pick against him and then him come back with some crazy submission and put Askarov out. So I'm going to pick Brandon Roy Vall. Not mega confident in it. Don't bet your good hard-earned money on this one. This, of all fights, because it is probably going to be so gosh darn exciting, this fight here is feet on the coffee table, crack open a couple of cold root beers, and enjoy. This is the fight that I'm going to be circling on the card as my enjoy the heck out of this kind of fight. Don't put anything on it. I love this fight. Should be fun from every for every second of the fight. But I'm going to take Roy Ball in the finishing department. Askarov should win if it goes to decision, though. But let me know what you think. If you think I'm underestim underestimating Askarov's finishing ability or overestimating his ability to win minutes in this fight, I would love to hear it. I do think that Askarov showed that he can battle through adversity in his last fight against Kaikara France. Although he did lose that fight, he did push push on pretty well in the end. And I think that is going to be something that he'll need if he's going to beat Roy Ball. Roy Ball has gotten finishes over most of his competition when he when he does win the fight. Um, that Brandon Moreno loss where his shoulder popped out. I don't know. I don't, I mean, uh, it's hard to say. Where would that fight have gone had his shoulder not popped out? I don't know. But for me, two top-level contenders... Both guys would make for an exciting title fight in the near future. I'm going to edge Roy Vall. I would love to hear what you think. Let's go to the next one. We've got two fights left on this card. And if you've made it this far in the video, hit the like button, would you? You've been here this long. Let's go. Uh, in addition to that, if you like this video and you'd like to see more content like this in the future, consider subscribing to the channel. I do these for every single UFC card, Dana White's Contender Series card, and Bellator card. At some point, I would love to add the others, such as PFL, LFA, all that, but I don't have time for that yet. So we need to get some more subscribers up in here so I can stop spending so much time at my day job and start making more videos like this for you guys. So subscribe to the channel, like the video, and keep watching because we've got two more fights on this card. And I can here we have Jonathan Martinez coming in four and one in his last five fights, taking on Cub Swanson, who is three and two in his last five. For this fight here, we have Cub Swanson, the 38-year-old, moving down to bantamweight for his first for his first time, uh, as far as I'm aware, for his first time against Jonathan Martinez, who's kind of on the come up right now, doing the darn thing, making his way to the top of the cards, as this is a co-main event, so working his way up there. This is going to be an interesting matchup, because in Cub Swanson's last fight, I believe it was with the, the finish win over Darren Elkins, he's shown that he can still strike with power can still work with some skill in there. He, I mean, that was a heck of a finish, okay? That kick put him down. But, as you see the asterisk there, that was also at featherweight. So for me, I don't know what Cub Swanson's going to look like at, like at Bantamweight. We'll kind of figure out a little more after the weigh-ins. Maybe it'll be smooth transition. I mean, Jose Aldo was able to do it without too much trouble. In fact, he looked really good. But for Cub Swanson, we don't know yet. It is usually a bad sign when somebody's towards the end of their career and they're moving down, especially at the lower weight classes. However, Cub Swanson's darn deadly. His Most of his losses have come to the highest level of grapplers. And it's not typically I put something about someone's losses as a positive, but in this, this one I do because Jonathan Martinez is going to want to strike with Cub Swanson. He, tip, he doesn't typically do a lot of high level wrestling or anything like that. He's more of a striker. And at least that's what we've seen in his fights in the UFC, and that's what I'm going off of. So for Cub Swanson, I don't think that's going to be an issue, which is why it's a positive here. He's not going up against a Frankie Edgar again, because Frankie Edgar is able to take him down, rinse and repeat. He's going up against a guy in Jonathan Martinez who he does he is a good minute winner on the feet. He mixes his leg kicks and his boxing really, really well. It's uh, it's it keeps his opponent 
guessing between the, the leg kicks, the boxing, he's able to weaken that front leg to take away any advantage that they've had in maybe throwing power punches or looking for takedowns, things like that. Their, their front leg is getting kicked relentlessly. But then after you think he's kicking that leg, the, and that's his, his primary path to victory, he starts throwing those hands and really lighten his, lighten guys up on the feet. Jonathan Martinez is a really diverse striker. We've seen it so far in the UFC. He's done really well. In fact, I picked him in most of his UFC fights. I might have picked him in every UFC fight. But either way, Jonathan Martinez has looked pretty darn good so far. I'm a big Cub Swanson fan, but I think this is a poor matchup for him moving down for his first time at Bantamweight. I would have loved to have seen him kind of get his feet wet against someone who isn't such a rising star. But I understand. You can't be giving your 38-year-old on the way out kind of fighters a uh, kind of a layup because if you do they could beat somebody get a couple wins and then just retire on you from a business perspective you gotta you gotta put them against uh, some up-and-comers and that's what they're doing here jonathan martinez being the 10 year younger fighter i believe he's only 28 years old probably should get the win here swanson does have good knockout finishing upside assuming he carries that power with him down to 135 pounds i do like martinez though let me know what you think. Martinez has really impressed the heck out of me in his last few fights. He's looked really good. Um, even, even in fights that going in, I wasn't as confident as I am in this one. I just, the, the moving down at the age of 38 scares me for Cub Swanson. Yeah, he looked good against Darren Elkins, but Darren Elkins is also probably, what is he, like 36, 37, something like that. He's also getting on the closer side to 40. So for me, Martinez is the pick. I do think Cub Swanson does have that finishing upside, like I said but I don't see it happening here. Martinez is pretty good at avoiding the strikes and using the, that long range boxing and leg kicks to keep the fight where he wants it. So that's where I'm at. Let's go to the main event. We got that still coming up yet. Hit the like, let's go. Folks, we have made it to our main event of the evening. We have Alexa Grasso taking on Viviani Arujao. For Arujao, she's coming in three and two in her last five fights. That last loss being to Caitlin Chikagian, sending everybody packing like she always does. Has some decent wins in those wins though. Uh, for Grasso over here, four and one in her last five, like I said, that one loss is to the now champion in Carla Esparza, where it was a close fight, but Esparza was able to use that wrestling to control enough of the fight to get the win here. So for these two in the main event, it's strong title implications here. The winner could be looking for a title shot coming forward. Now we know that this wasn't the original main event. It was originally Cannoneer versus Strickland, but Strickland has a finger infection. So here we are with this as our main event. Should be an exciting fight. So let's get into the, kind of the breakdown here and where I see things going. So for me, this is a classic striker versus grappler matchup. And the reason I say that is because Alexa Grasso, strong in the boxing. She's got good boxing, good clinch, but more from a dirty boxing perspective than your standard like tie clinch or wrestling clinch. She wants to use it for dirty boxing because that's what she does. She's a boxer. Um, she does have a speed advantage as well. And I think that comes in part with the youth. On the other side for Aru Zhao, she is 35, so she does... Does, she is starting to age for the women's flyweight division, but she has a lot stronger wrestling advantage. And in a, in a fight where Grasso is coming off of her only loss in her last five fight to someone who is able to use wrestling to control, that is a good upside to have. So for Arujo, a wrestling advantage, 2.23 takedowns per 15 minutes. She could use that, but that's obviously less takedowns than you're going to want in a 15-minute fight. Because you want her getting three of them if she's going to bank a three a three out of five rounds by using the takedown. So um, for me, I do think that Grosso's boxing is going to be the the winner on the feet. And I think that if this goes to the ground, Arujao does have a easy path to control, ground and pound, easy path to victory for Arujao there. Um, we did see that Arujao can fight through adversity throughout her, her whole career, honestly. Um, she's able to take shots, keep moving forward. Uh, can she doesn't crumble mentally going into a, a final fight or a final round of a fight so that will play in her advantage if she can bank an early round those last two could be something that could be good for her for Grasso we don't really know how she'll do in like a fourth and fifth round of a fight it's uh, she usually is three rounder so far um, but something that I will say on the feet Aruja only throws single shots and that's where Grasso is gonna Grasso is gonna have a really big advantage She's going to be able to counter those single shots, piece her up with her crisp boxing, because she does have really good boxing and at a high volume. So she's able to use that to her advantage in this fight. And I do think she's going to be able to bank more rounds than Arujao is. So for me, I'm going to pick Grasso here in the main event. Over five rounds, I think Grasso wins at least three of those. 
That is how that works. That's how that shakes out for a decision. I do think she gets that done. It may be once it might be one sided, but I do think there's at least one, maybe two rounds in there where Arujao is able to get the takedown and really control the fight. I just don't think it's going to be more of the rounds than Grasso is going to be able to, to keep the strikes coming, land the more damaging shots, which is the number one criteria. So I, I'm going to take Grasso here, but I won't be surprised if it goes the other way. I do not have a strong opinion on this one. Like I said, there's not a lot of fights on this card that I do have a strong opinion one way or the other. But for me, I'm leaning Grasso. Let me know what you think. If you think Arujao is going to be able to take her down and hold her there, I probably don't disagree with you. I just don't think she's going to be able to do it for all five rounds or three of the five rounds even. So that's my take. I'm super happy we got this card this week because next week, again, we don't have it. But what I'm going to think, what I'm thinking I'm going to do, for those of you who have stuck around this long in the video, you'll kind of get a peek behind the curtain again. Uh, I'm going to next week probably put out a couple of videos about some of the biggest fights on UFC 280 and kind of give you an early prediction for those. Maybe the top three fights or so on the card, um, kind of give you my prediction on those early, and then we'll do the full card breakdown come the week of that fight. So that way you can kind of get like an earlier sneak peek at those, and then we'll get the full thing going when that week rolls around. So anyway, that's the plan so far, unless I can come up with something else. I do have a couple of uh, professional fighters I've been talking with here to kind of get their opinion on the card. Say, hey, you know, let's get the let's get the pro fighters take on this. But I haven't really, I don't really know how I want to set up the interview style yet, or if I want to go that route. So, let me know what you think. If you think you'd rather just see me go right into the, you know, the main, the co-main, and then the featured bout of UFC 280 next week, or if you'd like to see an interview on the channel, it might not happen next week. But if you'd like to see it in the future, let me know, and we will go from there. But for now, we're done with this card. If you haven't done it yet, like, subscribe, comment, let me know. Tell your friends. Tell your friends' friends. Tell your friends to tell their friends and then their friends' friends. Tell your family. Tell your coworkers. Tell everybody to watch these videos because I want this channel to grow, obviously. That's why I'm doing it. And if it grows, we can get more videos like this out to you on other promotions outside of just the UFC and Bellator as well as the Contender Series. We can get PFL. We can get LFA. Maybe even one championships. We can get all the good stuff going. I just need more growth in the channel so I can cut down some of them work hours during the day. So that's where we're at. Love the video. I've rambled too much. Let's go.